Hi, welcome everyone. This is Pastor Manny Gonzalez from Gold River Calvary Chapel, and thank you for joining me for this edition of our midweek study. Uh, we're going into John chapter 11. John chapter 11. We're going to go ahead and close off this chapter, and we'll begin with verse 45. But let's start with prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, again for this day and again for this opportunity that we can gather, Lord, even if it's online, Lord, uh, via the internet and all. And we pray that your spirit again will speak to us and through us, through your word, through the power of your living word, Lord, that you may show us and teach us what it is that you would want us to understand and grasp, Lord, that we can uh, treasure in our hearts, Lord. Father, we ask now that you would bless our time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So one thing we can learn about God's redemptive history is that opposition will arise. Satan has been opposing God's work of redemption for humanity since the Garden of Eden. But God's plan throughout the ages has always managed to thwart it and overcome Satan's plan of destruction of, of the human race. God's will will prevail. Not Satan's will. God's will. He's going to make some damage, but God's ultimate will and plan for the salvation of humanity will ultimately prevail. In our study, we will see how the opposition against Jesus had reached its peak and the plan to kill Jesus was going to be set in motion. But what opposition Satan or man had intended against Jesus would eventually backfire for what they thought was just simply killing off uh, a, 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 just a mere man, Jesus. Jesus' action on the cross will become one of the greatest interruption or intervention for the souls of humanity. The title of this message is Opposition Against Jesus and God's Redemption. So with that, let's go to John chapter 11, if you have not there already, and we begin with verse 45 through and 46. Then many of the Jews had one, who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. So many people had seen Jesus' miracle these past three years of his earthly ministry, and it all culminated to Jesus raising a dead man, Lazarus, raising a dead man from the dead, bringing a dead man, a lifeless body, back to life. And as a result, there were two responses when it comes to Jesus. Many believed in Jesus, while others showed their disapproval of Jesus, who went out of their way to tell the religious authorities, who were by this time, not only hostile, but they were enemies of Jesus, the Pharisees in particular, of what Jesus had done. The first group who believed were convinced that Jesus was sent from God. Those who had gone to Mary were probably the ones that were his, those who came to comfort her, those who were there to mourn with her. And they were all key witnesses to, uh, to what happened. If this was a court of law, they will all have confirmed that Jesus, excuse me, that Lazarus was dead for four days. His lifeless body was laid secured in the tomb with the stone rolled in front of it to secure it. And everyone knew in that town of Bethany, you know, or maybe even those that were related or were friends beyond Bethany knew of Lazarus's death. Then they witnessed Jesus instruct them to remove the stone. And then he called out the lifeless body of Lazarus from the tomb. They witnessed Lazarus walking out of the tomb wrapped in his grave clothes from head to toe. You know, uh, one can experience the stench that came, of that, that came out of that tomb when the tomb was opened. All this to say is that they all witnessed Jesus, these are all eyewitnesses, first-hand account of Jesus raising a dead man, Lazarus, from the dead. And then have you been, if you've been following the first 11 chapters of the Gospel of John, Jesus was making the claim that he was indeed sent from the Father, that they may, have, they may believe in him and may have life in him. 
But not only did this group were convinced he was sent from God, but the miracles proved to help his claim as being one sent from the Father, that he was the I Ams. He was the coming prophet that Moses spoke of. And then, I mean, again, bringing a dead person back to life, I'm sure that just put him over the top. They believed in Jesus. But then there were others. In spite of knowing how Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, it's amazing. They, they rejected Jesus. They witnessed what happened, and yet their hearts were hardened. In fact, they rejected Jesus so much that they reported um, to the Pharisees of what Jesus did. And by reporting to Jesus, it wasn't um, it's, uh, seen as something positive, but this was something uh, seen as something negative. I mean, they were ratting out Jesus, all right? Whatever um, they had to say, they had to do anything about Jesus, they made sure that they went and straight to the religious authorities to let them know what was Jesus up to, okay? They were no friends of Christ. But to see and know what Jesus had done before many witnesses and still reject him, Again, that's nothing short of a hard heart. So we have people who turned to, into believers of Christ, while others turned into spies for the religious authorities who were against Jesus. And here's the point when it comes to Jesus. There is no middle ground. He doesn't allow a middle ground. If you think there is a middle ground, there is no such thing as a middle ground when it comes to Jesus. You either believe in him or you reject him. When it comes to Jesus, there is absolutely no fence sitting. There is no middle ground when it comes to Jesus. Verse 47 through 48. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. So here, the miracle of Je Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead proved to be too much, too much for these religious elites to ignore and to let go that they called in an emergency session, an emergency council, you know, a, a meeting within the council. And the council was known as the Sanhedrin, was considered the Supreme Court um, during back in the time of Jesus, ancient Israel. It was made up of 70 men and the high priest, and they also had a lot of influence and power over Jewish people and over Jewish society. And the question was asked, what shall we do? For this man works many signs. There was no follow-up question like, shall we go back and search the scripture? Shall we go and just wait a moment and let's seek God in this? No, not at all. Look, for the past three years, if they have been following Jesus, and they were following Jesus closely, they, have they never encountered anyone like Jesus, who did amazing, miraculous things, and who, who taught like nobody's business. But instead of giving the benefit of the doubt, and again, seeking God about this Jesus, in their eyes, the only way they looked at Jesus was that he was a threat. He was a religious threat, and he was a political threat. In fact, I want to mention about them not even praying to God again, because for what we have been studying in the Gospel of John, you know, prayer or seeking God for guidance about Jesus was never in the cards. It was never in, even in play. It's like they never sought God. But whatever they were concerned about was the fact that what they were concerned about was that Jesus had a growing effective ministry, was very popular. They were threatened that he was drawing this huge crowd of, of people, plus all the miracles that he did that not one of the religious leaders could make the claim that they had performed, not even least, not a single one. And Jesus had done many miracles and people were following him. But what was more crucial and more important is that people were starting to believe in him. And people have come to believe in him. As far as they were concerned, they sensed that, look, this guy's like the real deal. 
What are we going to do with this man? But if they were sensing that, it begs the question, why didn't they humble themselves and accept the claims of Jesus as one sent from the Father? But instead, they were looking after their own self-interest and were worried that they were going to lose the people who believed in him as well as their influence in their society. See, they had this arrangement under the Roman government that they were still able to um, exercise certain authority over the Jewish people. And if so, the religious authority, you know, if that's what they were concerned about, then the religious authority had abandoned their spiritual calling and became more of a political entity of, of sorts. You know, they, they, they wanted just the power. They didn't care that if Jesus was sent from God or not. And as far as they were concerned, Jesus was the only one who can dismantle all that they had built for themselves. In many ways, it's like they, they, they built their own little mini kingdom, these religious authorities. And as far as they were concerned, Jesus was a threat. So something needed to be done with Jesus. So notice that there was one group of people who knew the truth about Jesus. They knew the facts about Jesus, and they chose to believe in Jesus. And then there was the other group who knew the truth about Jesus. They knew the facts about Jesus, and yet they chose not to believe in Jesus, and they rejected him. Verse 49 and 50, not, verse 49 and 50. And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. So according to the members of the Sanhedrin, that they, they, they according to them, they, they feel like they're, they're caught in a dilemma because Jesus posed a problem with the people who looked to him and this arrangement that they had under the Roman government. But then the high priest of that year, Caiaphas, came up with a simple solution, and that was basically to kill Jesus. Problem solved. As one commentator shared, quote, sharing the members of the Sanhedrin, seeing the members of the Sanhedrin caught in the horns of a dilemma, he suggested a radical suggestion, a solution. Do away with Jesus. His argument was that it was better for one man, Jesus, to be put to death than that the whole nation of Jews should perish because of, Rome, of a Roman crackdown. Caiaphas' solution was rational and ruthless. See, fearing he was going to lose everything, sacrificing Jesus would spare, according to him, their nation while keeping the status quo. Jesus was indeed the true shepherd of Israel, whom they wanted to eliminate. But as another commentator shared, the Jewish people followed false shepherds into a war against Rome in A.D. 66-70, which, which did in fact destroy their nation. I'm, I'm sharing all this is because the very thing they wanted and thinking that they were, if we just eliminate Jesus, you know what, we get to keep... The, the power and the influence that, that was arranged under the uh, Roman government intact. Get rid of Jesus, everything is all good. But not realizing where this was going to go and where it was going to take them is that it was, they were just going to lose everything. Not only did it eventually destroy Israel, but they would later lose the temple, all right, which was at the time like, like one of the ultimate symbol of their nation and their people. You see, in wanting to secure and, and be in favor of, uh, of, the, of Rome by killing off Jesus, it proved to be only temporary, but yet fruitless. As I've said before, they lost everything. They eventually lost everything by, I think, by 70 AD. Now, I don't know if Caiaphas, the high priest, understood what he was saying and intended to do. But the truth was that Jesus was going to die for the people, but it was not going to be the intended consequence that he, Caiaphas, was hoping to achieve. In their hate, 
to eliminate Jesus, it was actually going to play a big part of God's sovereign redemptive plan of Jesus becoming the one to solve the problem all humanity have been plagued by since the Garden of Eden, and it's called sin. They thought that by planning Jesus' execution that things will go back to normal. What they had no idea was that their actions at the time concerning his eventual death would forever change the course of human history. They had no idea that the death and cross would be an act and a symbol of Jesus' victory over sin and death. Also, a victory against all opposition that came against him. Thinking their opposition against Jesus would, be, would get the upper hand, it would instead have a different effect. Caiaphas' um, solution was in many ways prophetic that would set in motion the greatest rescue mission to ever take place that will fulfill Jesus' purpose here on earth to echo the words of John the Baptist in John chapter 1, verse 29. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Verse 54 through 50, uh, excuse me, verse 51 through 54. Now this he did, not say on his own authority, speaking of Caiaphas, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. Therefore, Jesus no longer walked, walked openly among the Jews, but went from there into the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim, and they remained with his disciple there. Thinking he was offering, that is Caiaphas, you know, a solution to how to kill Jesus, God was the actual higher authority who would use Caiaphas's words as a word of prophecy that Jesus would become Israel's, Israel's last and final sacrificial lamb, becoming Israel as well as all of humanity, God's substitutionary atonement for all our sins. In, verse, in, view, in view of verse 52, the result of Jesus' sacrifice will create a new body of people who will become one people, the merging of the Jews and Gentiles called the church. Ephesians chapter 2 verse um, 14 through 16 says, For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. That, that the, the two both, the body that he's talking about is both Jews and Gentiles, and it was all going to be done through the cross. The Sanhedrin compromised, I mean, uh, comprised of, the Sanhedrin comprised mainly of Sadducees and Pharisees. Historically speaking, they didn't always see eye to eyes in everything. But there is something, or there is nothing, like uniting two opposing teams together over one common denominator to find and bring a solution. And in this case, was to kill off Jesus. So, the plot to kill Jesus was agreed upon and now is set in motion. But somehow Jesus got wind of their plot and he presumably, maybe if he was still over in Bethany, which is not far from Jerusalem, he and the disciples escaped into this area called Ephraim, which is just north of Bethany or north of Jerusalem. And there he stayed for now. Remember, though, that Jesus was under a different timetable. Jesus was on God's timetable. Thus, he was allowed to escape untouched, but for now. The religious authorities' frustration or failing to arrest Jesus is partly due to, and in fact, it's all have to do to, God not allowing for his son to be touched yet. Okay, that moment will happen, and we're going to see it here pretty soon. But the moment that it happens when Jesus is arrested, the plan of salvation will be set in motion. 
verse 55 through 57. And the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then they sought Jesus and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple. What do you think? That he will come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it that they might seize him. So here is the third and final Passover during Jesus' earthly ministry, and it was near, and the timing was no accident. The Paschal lamb or the Passover lamb was to be used for the Passover, the ultimate, but the ultimate lamb would become Jesus, the final sacrificial lamb offered for the forgiveness of all of humanity. Jesus was to become that lamb with many travelers and pilgrims coming from all over the place, all converging into Jerusalem for the Passover. This was the perfect time and setting for the death of Jesus on the cross to have its effect that would lead actually to his resurrection. Enemies of Jesus were being vigilant as to his possible appearance at Jerusalem for the Passover. I mean, they even posted men or guards, whoever, you know, in the temple that if they spotted Jesus, you know, they were to inform the, the religious leaders. In fact, that was the command that was given by the chief priests and the Pharisees, that anyone who, knowing the whereabouts of Jesus, were to let them know immediately so that they can go out, find him, and arrest him. But as we shall see next week, the religious leaders were going to see something that they never thought would happen or expected. And it is what we call Jesus' triumphal entry, which was like this great anticipation of Jesus' arrival into Jerusalem that many thought or saw him as this concrete Messiah. Okay? And Lord willing, that's what we're going to look into next week. But in closing, and this is going to be a kind of a long closing, but this is something I want us to look into and be mindful of and just think of what God has done from the time of the Garden of Eden all the way to that, that emergency meeting that took place for plotting against Jesus. Look, what I want to talk about, what I want to close with is this. The opposition against God's plan to redeem humanity extends back to the Garden of Eden. And the chief, chief opposition was, and it has always been, Satan himself. And it all started when he attempted, you know, two people made in the image of God to sin against God. And sa Satan has not let up since then. But God set into motion his plans to redeem fallen humanity in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where God said, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and the, between your seed and her seed. That one, her seed, that the word seed is capitalized, a, a capital S, his, her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The seed would be Jesus who would become the savior for all of humanity at an appointed time. The seed was foretold that he would ar arrive, but eventually will crush Satan. Thinking with the increase of sin, Satan would have all, you know, have uh, all of humanity under the tyranny of sin, thus destroying one another. And all. But God wiped all of humanity because, because of sin by a, this global flood, saving except, you know, with the exception of saving Noah and his family, thus God sparing the human race, not sparing just a family. God spared humanity through this one family from Satan trying to wipe out everyone made in God's image. Through the line of Noah, Noah to one of his, his three sons, Shem, his descendant Abraham would become the start of this rise of this new nation of Israel that the seed would come through and would survive many opposition through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, and all the way to um, David, between the, even the times of when other nations had conquered Israel. Between the period of Abraham and Moses, Satan tried to destroy the people of Israel, placed them under the bondage of Egypt. 
But God raised up Moses to free them from the, the Egyptian, Egyptian bondage. But a generation later died in the wilderness for their unbelief, which Satan loves to do to people, causing unbelief in the heart of, 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 of in their hearts to reject God. But once again, God spared his people, and a new generation, along with Joshua and Caleb, entered into the promised land. The coming seed, the seed that was to come, was once again protected within the growing nation of Israel. Through God's providence and grace, God would spare a Gentile woman who was a prostitute named Rahab when um, God's people uh, defeated Jericho. And she was integrated into God's people, marrying a, a, a Jew from which the seed would emerge um, generations later. You see, you can see God's hand of, of redemption, the, his work of redemption, and all the opposition that he overcame came from Satan that had happened since the Garden of Eden. Look, even later on, the line of the promised seed was once again threatened. Now, remember during the time of Queen Esther, one man sought the annihilation through decree to wipe out all the Jewish people. This act would be a threat against the coming of the promised seed from emerging later. But God, through his providence, intervened for his people, and were all spared. But that didn't stop Satan from his opposition against God's plan of redemption. Once again, Satan tried to intercept God's plan of killing the seed that was first promised back in the Garden of Eden when Herod ordered that all babies under the age of two were to be slaughtered in hopes that he would kill baby Jesus. But again, God spared um, God's people and the seed that did finally come to fruition. And they, were, they managed to escape that horrific slaughter. Furthermore, it was not beneath Satan to use two of Jesus's disciples in his attempt to keep Jesus from being humanity's savior and redeemer Satan would use Judas to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of sin, uh, silver, handling Jesus over to the religious authorities if he knew, he, you know, whether he knew he was um, being used by Satan or not. And then the other disciple tried to manipulate Peter. Listen to this exchange between Jesus and his disciples, and in particular, Peter. Reading from the CSB translation, Matthew chapter 16, verse 21 through 23 says, From then on, Jesus began to point out to his disciples that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and scribes, be killed and be raised the third day. And, G and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Oh, no, Lord, this will never happen to you. Jesus turned and told Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me because you're not thinking about God's concern, but human concerns. So though Peter did not want Jesus to die, Satan took advantage of this opportunity to use Peter as a pawn to prevent Jesus from being crucified. Jesus, recognizing that Satan was behind this, and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. This was really a duel between Jesus and and Satan that hearkened back in Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus was in the, temp, uh, in the wilderness tempted by Satan three times. It was the third and final temptation that Satan tried to alter God's plan of redemption. How, you might say? Well, Matthew chapter 4, verse 8 through 11a says, Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms, of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these, all these things I'll, I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him. If Jesus took Satan's offer and worshiped Satan and became ruler over Satan's, you know, earthly kingdoms and all. 
Jesus would not need to go to the cross, bypassing God's plan of salvation and become king himself. However, praise be to God, Jesus did not give in to Satan's temptation, and he did so by using God's words against Satan and rebuke Satan. Jesus' action kept him on point and on mission to die on the cross for the sins of the world. We ought to praise God for his divine and gracious providence for time and time again, he intervened um, to save humanity in the face of opposition from Satan. Satan has always had his hand in wanting to destroy the descendants of Jesus who became humanity's savior and redeemer. And now we have reached a point in our study that the ultimate showdown between God and Satan would now soon culminate through the death of Christ, which many of these religious leaders are now committed to doing right there at that emergency meeting in that one room, wherever they were at, where they held their, um, that council meeting. But Satan's opposition and his plans would turn to defeat when Jesus dies on the cross for he would be resurrected, defeating death, becoming the savior of the world, who ascended back to heaven, yet who indwells in the hearts of his followers through the Holy Spirit. But the defeat of the cross at the cross of Jesus would not and will not uh, stop Satan from setting his eyes on a new target. And that new target would be the church, mainly followers of Christ. At the birth of the church, there was the, the, the reli these religious leaders who hated Jesus started persecuting the church. Do you understand that? The persecution of the church, it wasn't, all, it wasn't about the Roman government all. It was, the, it was the Jewish sect. It was Judaism, if you will. The Jewish people went and after um, the church. And there was a man that came out of that, one person in particular, who was once a Pharisee, a bright and educated religious leader, was, who was an, uh, acting as an agent of hate for Satan who persecuted the church. But that is until God once again intervened for his people, the church, and the life of this one man who would then become the agent of God's grace to help establish and encourage churches. And that was the Apostle Paul who preached a message of hope, and that was Jesus crucified. Amen? Today, Satan is still having a field day, though, against um, the church. He's having a field day and attacking the church. He continues to attack every follower of Christ, for he knows an attack on God's children is an attack on him. He knows an attack on God's children in Christ Jesus is an attack on God himself. Satan thinks that he has the upper hand, but God always overcomes Satan and his plans. But this does not mean that Satan is done, or nor is he just sitting around doing nothing. However, one thing we can learn about God's redemptive history is that his plans will always foil, frustrate, and overcome Satan's plan and destruction. So we can see a history, a pattern from Satan wanting to destroy his opposition against God's redemptive work since the beginning of time, since the Garden of Eden. But I want us to leave off with a few promises of God from his word. First, remember, 1 John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 says, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. In other words, Jesus who is in us is greater than he who is Satan, the prince of this world. Okay. Secondly, in reference to the body of Christ, the church, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 says, reading from the New Living Translation, Jesus said, upon this rock, Speaking of himself, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. All the powers of hell will not prevail against God's church, the body of Christ, the believers. 
Satan will use any event and opportunity to silence the church or deem it non-essential, but God will not allow his church to be ineffective against growing opposition that Satan may throw our way, but will thrive under hardships. And then thirdly, Satan will be defeated once and for all because Revelations chapter 20, verse 7 through 10, records Satan's demise. It records Satan and his allies making one final push against the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus. And Satan will fail. In fact, Revelations chapter 20, verse 10 says, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophets are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Every opposition from Satan will finally cease for all eternity. Praise God. So the cost of God's redemptive plan throughout human history came at a cost, but his love for humanity and the destruction of sin is even greater. Praise God for his undeserving grace through his son, Jesus Christ, and never giving up on those created in his image. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, for our time. And we thank you, Lord, that we are special. And I think we need to be reminded of that. We love all your creation, but Oh, we are just so different because we are made in your image, Lord. And your desire is to save humanity, Lord. And, and we thank you that you never give up. Even when Satan throws his, his best, you overcome it, Lord. So we thank you, Lord, that you are the God who overcomes opposition, Lord. And that you are the God of many promises, Lord. And you have promised to, kept, to keep your word, and you did. The seed did come through, and that was Jesus Christ. And he did come and die for our sins, for which we are so thankful for. We praise you, Lord, and we thank you for the gift of eternal life that you have given us. All the good news, Lord, needs to be spread, Lord. It needs to be reached to the many all around us and throughout the world. So we thank you for all that you're doing. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me uh, for this week's um uh, study and then next week we'll go into lord willing chapter 12 so until next time blessings to you all bye